conception and, and reproduction. So once that has been done, then really it's just a source of problems for men. <laughs> uh, and why does it cause so many problems? And here, you've been waiting for this answer, I don't know. Um, it, nobody knows. I mean, it's just well, it's with so many things in the body that uh, have a temporary use, sometimes they then uh, cause problems later, and, and we really don't know why. But we have to deal with it. Most common thing is prostate enlargement, or BPH, is it's uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia with the traditional name. And, um, and really, in some ways, that's a bit of a misnomer because it's not just how the prostate grows, but it's all, or how much it grows, but it's also how it grows that affects whether someone is symptomatic. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, prostatitis with prostate infection and inflammation. And so, first touching on BPH, here on the left you have a picture of a nice, normal prostate. And on the left here, or I'm sorry, on the right side then, we have a prostate where the inside part, and actually there's a little small zone just right around the urethra that's in a very young man, uh, it's barely detectable. But in an older man, uh, it, it begins to grow, and that growth starts to begin already in our 30s and 40s, and it's, it's directly related to, to age. And uh, there's a bit of bad luck involved as well, because uh, it tends to run in families. And, uh, but it's a very common problem. And you can see in this picture, it's showing how the growth of the prostate is squeezing off that urethra, which is nice and wide open on the left, and it's having a hard time. And the bladder then has to work very hard to push the urine out past that, and that's what causes all the troublesome urinary symptoms, such as irritative symptoms, with, uh, like frequent urination, urgent urination, nocturial, meaning getting up at, having to get up at night to go to the bathroom, and then there's obstructive symptoms, which are things like a weak stream, hesitancy, which means trouble getting started, straining, uh, another one is intermittency, where the stream starts and stops and starts and stops. Now those are all obstructive symptoms, and then a sensation of incomplete emptying, where a guy just doesn't feel like he's, he's able to empty all the way. Sometimes he can, sometimes he can't, because we have to do a little ultrasound in the office to see whether or not he's emptying or not. But those are all the symptoms right there, and anybody who's ever had this problem, those are very familiar symptoms. Now, prostate, as well as being enlarged, can get inflamed or infected, and uh, prostate enlargement actually predisposes men to getting this. And it can be either an infection or an inflammation. It doesn't necessarily have to be infected. Urinary tract infections and SCDs can both be underlying causes, but most of the time, we don't know why prostatitis happens, it just does. And, um, and another thing that's very common, and we see this you know, in places where they have real active populations, I was in, uh, uh, where there's a lot of bike riding going on, I moved here from, uh, from Montana where I was at a large medical center there, and uh, a lot of active bike riders and outdoorsmen there as well. And uh, bicycle riding, anything with a straddle that puts pressure or prolonged sitting, uh, truck drivers are another uh, were another staple of my practice through the years. Uh, people who have to just sit for prolonged periods of time. So it isn't necessarily just infection. It can be anything that causes trauma or irritation. And uh, But again, bike riding is kind of the, the biggest culprit in terms of uh, how direct and how long the pressure goes on. But any of the other things can do as well. Prostate enlargement only complicates the issue and sometimes contributes to it. Prostatitis symptoms, what are they? Well, first of all, they're all the same things that you get with an enlarged prostate. The irritative symptoms, the, board, the obstructive symptoms that we just mentioned. But in addition to that, often, all too often you have pain, uh, and that pain can be very kind of vague. Um, you know, if I ask a man, point to your prostate, you're like, I don't know, and it's down inside you, right? And, it's, and there's really, and so sometimes men feel uh, pain in their lower abdomen, sometimes they feel it in their lower back, a variety of places uh, that, that pain can be manifested. And it can be kind of a dull uh, pain that can be very insidious and sneak up on you. It's not at all uncommon for me to diagnose somebody with prostatitis based on maybe some symptoms or even just an elevated PSA that clues us in that some inflammation is going on. After we put them on antibiotics and I see them back a month later and they're like, 
wow, I feel so much better. I had, I didn't even know I was not feeling well. I didn't know I had discomfort. Uh, and that pain can be with urination, it can be a constant aching pain. And again, this will usually not show up on any test except for a PSA test, which we're gonna talk about later. It'll often make that go up. But urine tests, urine cultures will not show any signs of infection. You can't, it's all based on symptoms and then on exam of the prostate. And as you can see from this uh, colorful picture, the inflamed prostate here, when something is inflamed, it swells. And this, this swelling now has caused some of the same obstruction of the urinary tract that the that, uh, urethra, that the, that the enlarged prostate did. But once you bring this inflammation down with the help of antibiotics and cyst baths and removing any trauma that might be going on, like either stop riding bike for a while or change to a more prostate-friendly seat or whatever it may be, there's a lot of things that we, we give people a long list of conservative measures uh, for treating prostatitis. And you know, a lot of one of the things that that you know we go on in with our treatments is that it's very important to have follow-up. It's very important not only to get the initial treatment, but it's also important to be coming back and monitoring how's that treatment working. And we have objective ways of measuring it, we have subjective ways of measuring it, and, uh, and that's very important because you don't always get it exactly right the first time, uh, it's, and it's very individualized. So for uh, prostate enlargement, we can treat with medication. The two most common kinds of medication are the first family are called alka blockers, and they relax the muscles around the prostate. Things like Flomax, Uroxetrol, Doxazin, Sinteraxacin. These names might, some of the names are things that maybe, oh, they're all generic now, but they used to be in ads and stuff. But those, they all do basically the same thing, and some of them have some different side effect profiles and different strengths and so forth. But they all basically work the same way, and we try to match the right medication to the right person. There are also medicines that shrink the prostate, and those are finasteride, or what was the brand name was Prostar, uh, or uh, Dutasteride, or Avogadrid, uh, and those medicines actually make the prostate smaller. And those work best in the very large prostates because they'll shrink the volume by up to about 30%. And so the bigger the prostate is to begin with, the more volume will be uh, shrunk, and uh, the more likely you are to get help. And those medicines also, uh, incidentally, the relaxation muscles, they, uh, uh, the muscle relaxation medicines work very quickly. They'll, we'll get results for that within you know, three to five days, certainly a week or two. Uh, the, the ones that shrink the prostate down, like finasteride or dutasteride, those take months, actually, to take their full effect. So often we'll start you know, people on both of them at once if they're having, and if the guy is having really severe symptoms. We'll get some initial relief from the alpha blocker, and then over time, as the as the uh, as the finasteride and dutasteride kicks in, then they'll get some increasing relief as the months go by. And the other nice, really nice thing about those med those shrinkage medications is that now the pharmacy the pharmaceutical companies that make them don't want me to tell people this, but really you only need to use it for about two years, and it'll have a permanent effect. And so you don't need to stay on that for the rest of your life. Often the, the, the relaxation muscles, are those are long-term ones. Once you take somebody off those, um, then uh, the symptoms will come right back, unless you've done also something to shrink the prostate. So once in a while, you know, we can get people off medications completely by using a true drug approach, and then uh, withdrawing first the one and then the other after a couple of years. And so it's kind of unique among medications like that, because most medicines are either or something really short term, like an antibiotic that you use for a few days or a few weeks at the most, and then you're done with it. Or there's something like a blood pressure medicine that you stay on for the rest of your life. And that's kind of an, this is kind of an unusual medicine in that regard, that, that a couple year course, and uh, you often don't need it anymore. And then we have procedures that remove that overgrown tissue, or procedures that can shrink or vaporize the tissue. And so that kind of, and we'll touch back on some of those things. Uh, with prostatitis, antibiotics is the first line therapy. But we also do the other things that I could talk about. Uh, hot, sitting in a hot bathtub uh, every, uh, every night for about 30 minutes. It has a tremendous effect. We really don't know why it does, but it does. Uh, heating pads don't do it. Take 
hot showers when you go to the sitting bath, hot bath tub has a big effect. Some of it we think has to do with, it helps the antibiotics work better. It helps increase blood flow and maybe helps them penetrate. But there's, I have guys who, I have guys with chronic prostatitis, you know, where it keeps coming back over and over again. The first sign that they feel it coming on, they'll get in that hot bathtub and just soak themselves really hot. And they can, they claim that they could head it off with the pass that way. So there's some effects of the conservative measures that we really don't completely understand. This is an important point. The antibiotics really need to be used for at least a month in order to have an effective treatment of prostatitis. All the time I see people who were treated by a primary care provider for a week or two weeks, and maybe they got a little bit better, but now they get worse, and then they get treated again. And really all it was is they didn't get treated long enough. The prostate is, a, is an organ that the antibiotics can't penetrate into very easily. And so I've had to treat people for as long as four to six months uh, in order to get them clear up those uh, clear the infection. And the BPH medication, incidentally, will also help with prostatitis, not just with the symptoms, but by relieving, you know, relaxing those muscles, letting the urine flow freely, reducing some of the, the, the pressures in there, uh, it can actually help the inflammation come down faster. So we'll use those on a temporary basis. When it comes to procedures, I always like to show this picture, you know, because everybody always wants to know, do you use a laser? You know, because it's really cool and sexy you know, to have use lasers, right? Um, and, you know, people think it's kind of like magic, you know? If you use a laser, it's got to be better, right? Well, not necessarily. There are uh, treatments that use lasers, like the green light laser, which uh, this is a picture of. Uh, there's um, different kinds of homium lasers and uh, Revelex and you name it. Um, but really, they're all just ways of, de of delivering energy that vaporize tissue. There are some ways of using it in which they're actually used to remove tissue. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. They're FDA approved, they, and they can work well. They especially work well in real small glands. Uh, but you know, in our in our group that I was in before, we had you know four urologists, and, and we had a couple people who did lasers to kind of specialize in that and really try to figure out how to do it right, um, so that we didn't have all of us just doing a few of them. And after going through a couple of different lasers, we, it ended up getting abandoned because the, the retreatment rates are just pretty high. Uh, there are some advantages to laser. There's some, uh, some short-term advantages in terms of blood loss and so forth, uh, but it's not the magic thing that we had hoped that it would be. Um, the real standby is still the transurethral section of the prostate, which is where we use a go in with a scope while someone is asleep or under a, a spinal, and actually physically trim out this tissue. It's not like scooping ice cream. Electrical cutting loop. Many people ask me, "Do you use a laser?" And I'm like, "Well, it's kind of like a laser," um, and, they, and then they're satisfied with that. Um, the, the truth is that it's, it's still that nothing. There nothing had beat it until we um, came up. The one problem with this, one of the main problems with this, was that you have to irrigate with fluid uh, that was always a glycine solution. That if you absorb too much of it that you could really get sick from it. So you had to really watch your resection times because uh, that solution would absorb into these raw areas. And now we've got, and I really think this is the greatest thing. Everybody's been looking for what's the, what's the, what's the holy grail of treating prostate enlargement because there's a lot of money to be made in it um, because so many men have enlarged prostates. And so if you can get somebody to try your machine a few times um, across the country, you know, you, you can actually make a lot of money. So everybody's always chasing after um, what's the best way to do it. This is a very simple device that you basically uses bipolar cautery rather than monopolar cautery. What does that mean? Monopolar cautery, you know, you put a ground pad on somebody and then whatever we're using to cut with, a, with an with electric cautery, that, that electricity goes through the body and comes out. You know, that's what's used to complete the circuit. The bipolar has the circuit in, included just right in the cutting loop itself. So actually that, like that energy is, is stays right there. And because of that, we can use normal saline for the solution and you can absorb as much of that as you want to and it's completely safe. With the old fashioned Turks, you've got to be careful not to resect for longer than an hour. This you could probably resect for several hours and, and not have the kinds of risks that you had uh, with the other. So, and we, and so this is kind of the way a lot of people are going with their turfs. It's certainly what I am doing here at Barton. And uh, it's, a, it's a great, we also use it for bladder tumors. It's a, it's a great invention. Moving on to prostate cancer, it's the most common solid uh, tumor in men. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in men. Uh, statistics are predicting 
30,000 uh, new cases per year in the com this uh, coming year. 29,000 deaths projected. Uh, one in seven men are diagnosed in a lifetime with ankylosis. Well, that sounds really bad. And, but there's good news too. And the good news is prostate cancer often is not an aggressive disease. Most men with prostate cancer will not die from it. And increasingly, we can observe people, they do not need to be treated at all. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about observation, uh, but uh, observation is, um, I think is the current age, is the cornerstone of treating prostate cancer. Uh, it should be the first thing that you think about and the last thing that you rule out. And uh, I started, I st and this was very difficult when I first started um, introducing people when the first large studies from John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins and Mayo came out that saying that the observation was safe. My patient population was very resistant to it. Why is that? Because every man they knew who had had prostate cancer had had surgery or radiation or seed, and that's what they wanted too. Whatever their buddy had, that's what they wanted. And so uh, it wasn't until I had, I got a couple of doctors who were, I, I could, you know, sit down and go over the data and say, look, I really think you are a great candidate for observation. And they said, sounds good to me. And then I could start to tell my patients, you know, I've got doctors who are doing this. And that really helped. And the other thing that helped is I start telling people about observation before I even do their biopsy. Because what happens when you call a guy on the phone and say, you've got prostate cancer, you need to make make an appointment, come in and see me in a couple of days, we'll talk about it. By the time I actually see them, they already have the guy that they've been talking with in the morning and their brother and their friend, you know, from college across the country. They'd already decided on their treatment before they, what, what they were gonna have done before they ever came in to talk to me. So I started putting this idea in their head about observation and we'll, uh, and that's really been uh, an important thing. So how do you diagnose it? Well, first of all, rarely is it diagnosed by symptoms because it's an asymptomatic thing while it's in the treatable uh, phase. PSA, prostate-specific antigen, which is a blood test that you can use for screening. Uh, prostate examination, uh, the old visual rectal exam, is very important because about 20% of prostate cancers are only found through that. People have a completely normal PSA, and what's more than that, the worst cancers, the highest grade cancers, often will have a normal PSA. And the reason for that is that, and I'll show you some pictures later that will kind of explain that, but the more high grade a tumor is, the less it's like prostate tissue. The more abnormal it is, the less likely it is to make PSA and put it into the bloodstream because it's just not even like prostate tissue anymore. And so sometimes they'll have a PSA of one and it'll be a horrible, very advanced, high grade cancer. Symptoms are, do make somebody at higher risk but symptoms alone are not, uh, such as voiding symptoms and so forth, are usually not how we identify people. It's usually through a routine screening, and um, there are additional risk factors that help us determine when to screen people. Um, and those risk factors are age, the older you are, the more likely you are to have it. So you have that sweet spot of if you're too, if you're too young, then you really shouldn't be screening. And if you're older, He's going to outlive his cancer even if he develops it more than likely. Ethnicity, um, African Americans have a higher incidence of prostate cancer, and when it happens, it tends to be more aggressive. Family history is a big thing. The more first degree family members you have, you know, if you've got an uncle who had it, yeah, you got a higher risk, but if you got two brothers and a dad and a grandpa, now you've got a very high risk, not only of having it, but of having a more aggressive disease if you do have it. Um, Symptoms, again, are a risk factor. Obesity is a risk factor just in general from a population standpoint. Um, it, 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 is, it has been shown to have some uh, uh, risk factor. People always ask me about diet. There's, there's, some, there's some population study, uh, studies that, that indicate that maybe there's a relationship between the Western high-fat type diet and versus uh, more of an Asian low fat diet, you know, because of uh, people of different ethnicities and having higher rates of prostate cancer as a population. 
But it's important to remember that just because you have a population and you take a look at, at 100,000 people in one group and 100,000 people in the other group, and there's 5% higher rate of this in that group, that doesn't necessarily mean by changing your diet that you're going to, look, that you're going to reduce your risk. It may, but there's no evidence at this time that changing your diet or taking any kind of supplements or anything like that. Um, all of those have, in large, well-designed studies, all those things that looked promising at first have not panned out. Now, why is there controversy about screening for prostate cancer? You think, yep, cancer, why wouldn't you want to find it? Well, and this is the answer. Most men with prostate cancer won't die from it. And prostate cancer treatments have risk. Therefore, we knew in the past, and it wasn't, this wasn't any mystery to those, so, you know, when I was coming out of training um, 15 years ago, we treated everybody that had prostate cancer, whether it's a little bit of low-grade cancer or a lot of high-grade cancer, everybody got treated because we didn't really know anything else to do. There was no evidence of who was it safe to watch, who, who was it not. We knew we were treating more people than used to die from it, which meant that, therefore, people were being treated who did not need to be treated. We just didn't know who they were. Um, and so there has been over-treatment, and even, unfortunately, and I'm sad to say this, even after, even after the data was starting to come out showing that observation was safe for low volume, low grade prostate cancers, all too many urologists and radiation oncologists around the country contributed, continued to treat everybody. And there was a big expose in the Wall Street Journal some years back that you know with some of these groups that would own their own radiation um, machine, and um, you know you make a huge amount of money out radiation treatment, way more than off surgery, and they were treating people with, you know, who were 80 years old with low-grade cancer in some of these um, some of these bigger city centers, and there's really only one reason to do that, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it, but that's, that's how it is, you know, maybe some of the older guys were so stuck in their ways, but, you know, the evidence was very clear that it was safe to watch, and, that, and, and, and because of that, there was a reaction by the public health service, but public health, public screen community against prostate cancer screening. And, um, but I wanna also point out that part of the reason, the legitimate reason for overtreatment way back when was that the generation of guys who trained me had watched men die over and over and over from prostate cancer and it was a miserable way to go. And so when PSA came along, it was like something from heaven because there, before that, there, it was so rare to ever catch prostate cancer at a treatable stage. It was always caught too late. And so, so that's why everybody jumped in and just started treating all of it because they didn't like what they'd seen before. And so, you know, the pendulum swings back and forth. And like I said, it's a bad way to go and it was untreatable by the time we found it. So what are the current recommendations from the American Urological Association? Um, which is what we as urologists uh, follow. First of all, they recommend no screening under age 40. And I agree with that, with one caveat. If I've got a guy who's 35 sitting in my office who tells me I've got two brothers and a dad and a grandpa and they have high grade cancer, I check the PSA, okay? Um, just one, and if it's normal, then I won't check it again until they're 40. Uh, but, but, but the reason I do that is because I, I had caught prostate cancer that was pretty bad at age 40 when the guy gets his first screening. And so if I get a chance to, to, to nab him at age, uh, age 35, I'm gonna take it. Uh, but by and large, there shouldn't be any screening under 40, well, except for rare circumstances, in, in, in my opinion. Age 40 to 54, we recommend screening the higher risk people, um, African Americans, family history, symptomatic and then from age 55 to 69 that's the prime group right here that is a good candidate for routine screening but there are recommendations that are still before you screen you discuss risk and benefits now that's easier said than done because when I diagnose somebody new with prostate cancer I sit down with them we get the biopsy report in front of us we know they have cancer it takes me a good 40 minutes to an hour to go through all of the options that they have. Now, if you back that up to, should we do a biopsy or not? Now, you've got to decide, well, 
what would happen if we don't do the biopsy? What would happen if we do do the biopsy? If we do this treatment, we don't. It gets very complicated. Then if you back it up even further, should we even get a PSA in the first place? I'm not even sure I know how to do this counseling of risks and benefits. And the truth of the matter is I have seen it to primary care providers. I've got at least one out here that can correct me if I'm wrong. Is what I've seen is that primary care providers have tended to throw their hands up and either say, I'm not screening anybody, or I'm going to keep screening everybody. Am I wrong? <laughs> so, you know, that's that's just kind of what happens. Just because, you know, it, it's such a complicated thing to do, even for somebody who is an expert in prostate cancer. So I think this group, in general, should be screened. But, they, you know, you do need to let, uh, I do let them know there is controversy about this. This is an optional thing. And um, you have to just decide. If you know for sure that if we found prostate cancer that you wouldn't want it treated, then we shouldn't even be checking this test. But if you think you would want it treated or might, then that's the reason to screen. After age 70, they, they recommend no routine screening. However, as those of you who live up here around the lake know, there are 70-year-olds and then there are 70-year-olds. Um, and some of them go screaming by you on the ski slope or whatever, you know, those 85-year-old uh, speed demons. You know, but you know, and at age 70, if, you know, that person may biologically be more like a 60-year-old, just like you might have a 60-year-old with carrying in an oxygen bottle who's been smoking three packs a day, who is more like a 75-year-old. So we we kind of look at this as what's the person's biological age, and look at everybody as an individual, not just as a number, and say, no, I'm sorry, you turned 70, you know, yesterday, so I'm not going to screen you. I would have screened you two days ago. But no, you look at it as an individual thing. And the main thing we're looking for is there a 10 to 15 uh, year life expectancy. If we just find that the PSA is elevated or there's an abnormal exam, we go on to a biopsy. We, we randomly space the biopsies in the prostate, as this little diagram shows. And the needle takes a little tiny core out. They look like little pieces of thread about that long. Uh, we put them in little bottles. And, um, and this is a view. This is kind of what it looks like on the ultrasound to us. This is the prostate there, and then we, we basically you know, randomly space them, and hopefully wherever that prostate, at least one of those uh, will hit the cancer if there's one there. Usually we can't, this is not this got a nice red dot, but they don't have a red dot, okay? Most of the time you can't tell the difference. It's rare that you can actually spot a prostate cancer on an ultrasound. Sometimes you can, you see a dark area, it doesn't, that looks bad. But most of the time it all looks the same, and you just randomly space it, hope that one of those things hits the cancer. And if you do, this is what we're going to find. Now there's, uh, many of you have maybe heard of a Gleason score. What a Gleason score just is, is what does the pathologist see when he looks at that microscope, under that biopsy of the microscope? He's going to grade, you know, he's going to say it's cold, uh, stone cold normal, where he's going to say, ah, there's some, ab some abnormalities, there's some abnormalities in how the glands are formed. I call that a grade two. Increasing with a little more abnormal, that's a three. Uh, here's some really abnormal stuff, four. This, you know, you can see that doesn't look anything like that, right? That is, you know, this is a high grade tumor. You put that under a microscope, a pathologist would have trouble telling you is this from the prostate, is it from the lung, is it from the colon, where is it from? They wouldn't know because it's so unlike prostate cancer. And then they look at what's the most common thing we see, they, that's the first one, and then what's the second most common pattern we see. So it'll be, you know, if they say, well, the most common thing is all three, then it's a three plus three. If the most common thing is a three, and the second most common is a four, then it's a three plus four or a seven, and so forth. And basically a six or a five or six, so it's some, something that's in this range right here, that's your low grade stuff. That's the stuff you should be watching. When you get up into the sevens or the eights or the nines, that's that's when you're getting increasingly serious increasingly bad outcomes uh, without treating the cancer, not treating the cancer. So observation again, first choice. That should be um, the, the, the default setting, in my opinion, is to not do anything. What we mean by observation is not have a fishing pole, go have a nice life. Observation means we check the PSA regularly during the first couple of years. We repeat the biopsy once a year, at least for the first couple of years. And up to the, up to the first, some of the original studies recommended a yearly biopsy for five years. Again, I individualize it. 
depends on what I find. If I find a little bit of prostate cancer, the original biopsy, at one year, <coughs> I biopsy and I don't get anything, then I know it must be really small. If I, did, I get it one time, didn't get another, well, then I biopsy it again for a couple of years and just watch the PSA. So it's individualized, but we have some generalized protocols that help us to do that safely. And then if it changes, on the, on the repeat biopsy, the first one was at least at six, now it's at least at seven, it's probably time to consider treating. Um, and you're still going to catch it in time. If, as long as you're observing something that's low grade. If you observe somebody who's at least at seven or at least at eight, you're asking for trouble because maybe it's curable now, but it won't be curable in a year. Brachytherapy, which is radioactive seed implantation, is, as far as I can tell, is increase, being used increasingly less and less and less. The reason for that is observation. Observation is just such a better way to go with these low-grade treatments. And there's a lot of risks uh, or side effects that come from brachytherapy. So I used to do a lot of brachytherapy, and I just turned around one day and realized I hadn't done one in two years. Uh, and the reason for that, all the people I used to do brachytherapy on are now getting observation. We have cryotherapy, or freezing of the prostate, very minimally invasive. You stick these little needles in there, they freeze it down to 560 degrees below zero. And, um, it, and then you do what you're not supposed to do after you thought out a frostbite, and freeze it again. So nothing survives that, but also the nerves that give you erections don't survive either. So uh, unless you're done with sexual function, that's not a good treatment. But for somebody who is done, has a high grade cancer, maybe not a good candidate for surgery, it is a wonderful, wonderful treatment. External beam radiation, tried and true. Up front has low side effects and complications, but complications side effects tend to happen later. So in my, my book, the older somebody is, the better the candidate they are for external beam radiation, because the less chance that they're gonna get these delayed bad side effects or complications from it. And the younger they are, the more we tend to lean towards surgery. The other thing is that um, sexual function, in, in the short run, the first couple of years, radiation does way better. But when you look at you know, five years later, now, Prostatectomy groups, the people that have a good nurse sparing prostatectomy, are actually doing better with sexual function than the external beam group was. And so, um, and so again, it's an individualized choice for each patient. It's an individualized discussion. We're just kind of going over it uh, of the ways we've done. We did open, you know, I did hundreds and hundreds of open prostatectomies. Uh, but then the robot came along, and you know, it was kind of shocking to me, really. It's kind of like the laser thing, right? When we introduced the, the robot, the prostatectomies, and you know, and we've done you know a few of them, and you know, at our institution, like everybody, you have to do your first ones, right? And you say, I tell people, look, I know I can give you a better operation with the open. You're going to get better comments. You're, you know, I can I can give you more of a of an assurance, not a guarantee, but more of an assurance that it's going to go well in terms of directions and you know, stuff like that. In the first year, I had one person choose an open prostatectomy. Everybody chose the robotic. They didn't matter what I told them. I would sit them and tell them, you know, here, you, you do it this way. They would still choose the robot. And you know, if I told them it was a laser robot, then they probably would, after that one guy probably wouldn't have even chosen it. But by the time a year went by, I could no longer tell them that I would give them a better open operation uh, because I'd done so many robotics and so few opens. And that's kind of the situation around the country today where some of the, old, you know, the older guys are still you know, very good at uh, open prostatectomies, just like I was. Um, but you know, the younger guys that are coming out of training, and gals that are coming out of training, are, are this is all they're doing, is robotic um, prostatectomy. So that's kind of where, where things are going. Incontinence, erectile dysfunction are the big two complications that we worry about. They can happen with any of these, except for observation. Um, and they just happen at different times and in different ways. There's a whole bunch of other things that we do when we're having an individualized discussion with people. External beam, we radiated, and uh, five days a week for eight weeks. Didn't do a lot of uh, radiation in Montana, or as much radiation in Montana, because where I was before, because so many of my patients go two, three hundred miles away, they couldn't be driving back and forth to get their radiation every day, and so they tend to come and get their surgery. But for people who live in town, it was a lot better. Uh, the, the good side thing is you treat the prostate cancer, there's no risk of anesthesia, anesthetic for complications. Um, and even if a little cancer is outside of the prostate, it gets it. Um, the downside is that it also radiates the things outside the prostate, like the rectum and the bladder, and the, the nerves for erections and so forth. And
and they get affected over time. Here's a picture of the Vinci unit where we do our robotic prostatectomies. You have one assistant at the bedside, you have the surgeon at the console running, and it's really not a robot you know, in the sense like you know it can think for itself and develop consciousness or whatever. It's a master-slave device where you, whatever your hand does, that's what the instruments do. And it's really cool because you can get into tight corners and, and you can turn corners. You can do things that you can't do with, with an open operation uh, or a stand, certainly not with a standard laparoscopic operation. For advanced prostate cancer, if somebody has failed their initial treatment or maybe they were too far gone but we pushed on them, androgen deprivation in the old days we used to testicles off surgically to take away the testosterone and that would give them some good real good years without their prostate cancer before it would start to come back slowly. Now we have medications to do this uh, and that's good because we can give it to them for a while, go take them off it for a while, go back on it. Whereas when you remove something surgically you couldn't put it back on again. So this is really good. We do intermittent, usually that's an intermittent therapy. And then there's lots of new chemotherapies and Again, most men don't die from their cancer. Part of that is because of the benign nature of the disease, relatively speaking, compared to more aggressive things like, say, pancreatic cancer or lung cancer. But also part of it is that our treatments are getting better and better on this end. That used to be that once this stopped working, you were done. It really was fishing full time. Have a nice life. But um, and you know, keep somebody comfortable. But now we have a lot of we have a lot of new uh, things that are more than I can. So that's kind of a quick down and dirty overview of prostate issues. Uh, any questions, comments from anybody? Uh, what do you know about the PPA-3? It's a tumor marker that's, um, you know, there are any number of tumor markers that are being used right now. As far as I know, none of them have been definitively proven to be so reliable that you can go away from the traditional ways of screening with PSA and the traditional decision-making things. And there's all sorts of things, and, and I'm not saying that they're not valuable. I'm not saying that they can't, uh, cannot add something to it. But the question I always ask is, is this really going to change how I manage my patient? Is this really going to change? And as of right now, and maybe I will be you know, apprised of new information for at any time that will change that to where it will become a mandatory standard thing. But right now, right now, it's something that some urologists choose to use and they find it helpful and others others of us don't tend to use it. But there well that's the goal, that is the holy grail that we're all looking for is is there are there tests, other tests besides because we know the PSA is not a great test. It's a it's a very crude test that just says something may be wrong here, look into this more. What we would like is highly specific tests that can tell us cancer, no cancer, dangerous cancer, not dangerous cancer. And with enough certainty that we're willing to make a lifetime decision for a man based on that. And I think we'll see that in the next 20 years. I think we will see testing that will, that will allow us to identify, maybe we'll even be able to do without the biopsy. Wouldn't that be great? Um, it's not that bad as long as you get anesthetized, which you know, I always numb everybody up before it. Just like there's some urologists who won't numb people up before a prostate biopsy, saying, "Well, we're sticking a needle in there anyway." And I'm like, "That's like saying I'm not going to numb your tooth up because it's going to hurt anyway, just to put the numbing medicine in." You know, it, it, <laughs> trust me, it doesn't feel that good to not be numbed up for a prostate biopsy. Yes, sir. You say your PSA screening in your blood once a year. That's you know, one of the, one of the one of the, no, once a year is kind of what I do. The the data shows that it's just as safe to do it every other year. The problem with every other year is people forget. Is that did I do it last year? Did I do it this year? Now some people are so organized that they will remember. But most people are, do best kind of being on a, on a regular schedule. And once a year is about as often as infrequently as reliable screening can go on, in my opinion. But Data has shown that every other year is just as safe as far as outcomes. So if you have, like, let's say, usually like the number, the magic number is what, about more than 2 You're talking about for the PSA? Yeah, PSA. Depends on your age. That's never huge. 
If you're 55, four is, is a trouble number. If you're 70, four is completely, 4.5 is probably normal. You know, in the low, you can be above four if you're in your early 70s. If you're in your 80s, maybe five or higher is normal. And, and if you're 35, you know, two and a half is probably a dangerous number. You know, that's, that's gonna make you really worried. So you really have to do an age-adjusted look at the number um, before, uh, and that's one of the things that's, and it's really kind of sad because a lot of the lab tests still have the zero to four is normal written there, and then that's what puts the star by it, and the busy primary care provider looks oh, normal, 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 normal. But increasingly labs are starting to, to have you plug, plug the person's age in, and they'll, they'll, when the person's date of birth is in there, they'll use that to say how old the patient is, and then they'll give an individualized um, normal range for that person at that age, and that's the best way to do it. So, um, so the, the old thing was four because that was the best we knew. But now, now we know that it's it's much it has to be much more individualized than that. But anyway, th what was the rest of your question? Yeah, and so if uh, if, uh, if you do a digital induction, um, you know, you know, um, mm -hmm. uh, how reliable? What you're looking for is if a person has an abnormal digital exam, they've probably got about a 15, 20% chance of finding cancer on a, on a biopsy. And if it is cancer, it's probably gonna not be a good one. But most people are gonna be negative who have just, who have normal PSA, but, a, but an abnormal exam. If you have an abnormal exam, I mean a normal exam, but an abnormal PSA, your positive rate of biopsy is more in the 30% range, give or take. And then if you've got both an abnormal exam and a high PSA, then you, know, you might approach 40, maybe even knocking on the door 50%, especially if you add some other risk factors in like family history and age or ethnicity or whatever. And so, um, so you, the fact that somebody has a normal PSA, but, a, but I mean, Abnormal PSA with a normal exam doesn't shouldn't be reassuring any more than vice versa. Either one of them is a warning sign, and, and by itself. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. We're done. So uh, appreciate your time. You know, I happen to be a paranormal investigator with a team based in Carson City called Finvale Investigators. And we have explored and investigated many, many places in the northern Nevada region. One of those places happens to be a historic home and an antique store. It's called Antiques Plus in Genoa. It was the house that was built by the one and only Genoa Undertaker, and it's called the Dake House. It's very, very haunted. And we have had many paranormal experiences in that home. It, um, we've captured all kinds of spirits floating around in there. We have captured all sorts of anomalies like orbs and mists, faces. We have captured all kinds of stuff like that on our film. We've also captured a lot of EVP, which is electronic voice phenomena, which is ghost speak. And that's really cool when you have a digital recorder and you say, hi, spirit, would you like to talk with me? And they say yes. That's an awful lot of fun. We have captured videos, pictures, and EVP inside of the Dake House. And it is extraordinary, extraordinary what's in, been in there. Now, I've written a book about the Dake House. 
It is called the Victorian Past and Haunted Present of the Dake House. And inside this, I start out with the history of the Dake House. Charles Dake, the undertaker, was actually a carpenter, and he was the uh, uh, chief of police. I'm sorry, he wasn't chief of police. He was a, where was he? <laughs> I'll figure that out in just a minute. I can't find it on my notes here. <laughs> he actually did not have his undertaker parlor in the house, as was the fashion. In fact, it was about an acre to the north of the house where he had his undertaker parlor. He did his other type of business in a barn and also inside of his house. There is a huge barn on the property and that was a place where the bodies were held in the wintertime, waiting for the spring thaw so the bodies could be buried. And justice of the peace, that's what he was. And he, he performed uh, those type of duties inside the house, so he didn't want his undertaker's business to be in the same house where people are getting married. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> All right. Um, the barn is very haunted also. In fact, on May 4th, the owner of the Dake House happened to have a barn sale during Cowboy Poetry Weekend. And I went inside to take some pictures, do a little mini investigation. Very, very haunted. She has an old doll there that nobody has purchased. It looks like it's wearing a sailor's outfit, and that doll is very haunted too. I can see why she keeps it out in the barn because I don't think I would want to purchase it, to tell you the truth, and I really wouldn't want it inside of the Dake House, which now is Antiques Plus, where she's got fabulous, fabulous antiques. Now, having raised, uh, Dake having raised his family inside of this awesome house, he sold the house in 1909 to Pony Express writer Theodore Perry Hawkins. And he raised his family in it until 1949 when they left it abandoned. And for the next 20 years, it just fell into shambles. Well, in 1962, Bernice and Ted Huber, they were running around trying, trying to see just where they could find because they wanted to move up into the northern Nevada region from California. And they happened to see the Dake House. And Bernice was a person who loved to take a dilapidated old home or business and hotels and restore them, which is exactly what she did to the Dake House. And to this day, it's absolutely beautiful. Uh, what they did inside, the restorations, um, they had to put in new windows, new floorings. In fact, with the owner now, she was 13 years old when they moved in, and she said when she walked in, she stepped on a floorboard and went up to her knees. <laughs> the, the floor just, just broke right underneath her. So, um, and today, Martha, which is the owner, Martha Williams is the owner of the Dake House, she says that the restoration is continuing. It's, it, it's continuous, but she says it's a lot of fun to keep it restored and updated, and it is in the National Register of Historic Places because she has never moved it. The house has never been moved, and there has never been any huge major reconstruction restoration to the home. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty cool how that is. Uh, it's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Okay. Now, since 2005, we have gone uh, ghost hunting in there, myself and my ghost hunting team, Thinville Investigators, and we have seen all kinds of spirits in there, like I was saying. There happens to be a very large portrait of roses, pink roses, on a vase, I'm sorry, in a vase on a table. And there was a spirit attached to that, there still is. But every time that Martha would try to sell it, if there was a purchaser that was interested, this portrait, this painting, would fall off the wall. It almost caused a fire at once or it would disappear. It would fall behind another piece of furniture. Martha, back in, I believe it was 2005, asked me one time if I could please come in and find out who the spirit was, which I did. And it was a woman by the name of Mary, and she just did not want that portrait sold because it was hers. 
And so I told Martha that. Martha said, okay, well, we just won't sell it. Now, this portrait happens to be globally known. There's been people from all over the world that have come to Genoa, to the Dake House, to see this haunted uh, portrait. It has been presented in a number of media, newspapers and magazines, and also on TV. So it hangs in one of the parlors, and it's a beautiful portrait, but it's just not for sale anymore. I have to add here that I am a psychic, and that's how I, I make my living. Of course, I was talking earlier about my psychic stones, but I also have an ability to where I can see people that have crossed over, and that's how Martha and why Martha asked me to come in and to look for the spirit that's around this haunted uh, painting because I can see and she just has a no pun intended a death grip on this portrait because she just does not want anybody to buy it that's that's going to stay in that uh, dake house for for <laughs> well forever all right. If you happen to be in Genoa, please stop by the, the Antiques Plus. It's at the south end of town. And just look around. Uh, she's got, like I said, wonderful antiques. There's something for everybody there. And you can also purchase my book there. Let me put this down here. Okay. My book is sold uh, at the, uh, uh, the Dake House. And I can also sell it to you at my website, which is www.sandypsychicstones.com slash books dot html. You can purchase that on my website. The first part has history of the house, and then it goes into the history of Martha and her family, the restorations and what they've done, and then it flows into the paranormal activity that we Thin Veilers have um, captured on film. We've had all types of events at the Dake House. In fact, we've had, uh, since 2006, we have a spirit tour, and that's a lot of fun. People can come in and we talk about the paranormal activities and, and the ghosts and the spirits that we have found inside. And we also have, well, refreshments, and we have that around Halloween, so that's always fun. And then if time and weather permitting, we take the clients up to the uh, cornerstones, actually, which are still on the land that the um, Undertaker Parlor was there. Uh, during an avalanche, the Undertaker Parlor itself was kind of like taken off down into the valley, but the cornerstones are still there. And they're very interesting because most of the guests that come for the spirit tour, when they stand on that cornerstone, they get very dizzy or they get nauseous. It's very interesting how the cornerstones have remained haunted. That's a lot of fun. So if you happen to be in Genoa, please stop by, say Sandy sent you, and uh, ask for the book. I also have two other books, Thin Veil Investigations and Silver Ghosts, and they also are sold at the Dake House and my website and the Cobweb Palace, and they all have stories about the Dake House inside. It's a, it's a good book, if I can say so myself. It was fun writing this, and it's just kind of a nice book, too, for the community, for museums, because there hasn't ever been a book written about the, the Dake House before, outside of stories here and there in different books. And so this kind of gives you the full-blown, well, everything that you need to know about the Dake House is, is in my new published book. So thank you very much for watching my show, and we will talk to you next time.